began his public ministry by withdrawing into the desert for 40 days and 40 nights and there to fast and pray. It was in that fearsome self-surrender to the Father that Satan came to tempt the world's Redeemer to see whether or not this Son of Mary was in reality the Son of God. As he had done with Adam, the devil directed his first attack on Jesus through the senses. The Lord was extremely hungry because his fasting had been absolute. Turn these stones into bread, whispered the seducer, and so he will do to us throughout the whole of Lent. Give up your fasting, give up your mortification. What does any of it serve anyway? This temptation, beloved, appeals to our basis and car carnal weakness, the debilitation of our will run ragged by the concupiscence of our fallen nature. Like Christ, you must resist this first temptation of the devil. In Genesis, the devil tempted our first parents in the same way. If only you would eat of the fruit of this tree, you will become like God himself. This same assault, capital in the ruin of the entire human race, was tried next on the Lord. Satan took Jesus to the pinnacle of the temple and tempted him to summon angels to carry him to safety, and doubtless to the adulation of the crowd gathered below. And Satan does the same to us. He puffs up our worldly pride to the ruin of humility and prayer, the turning of our hearts from a rightful submission to divine truth to worldly matters. And finally, just as he had promised Adam knowledge like that of God himself, that he should know and therefore possess all things, Satan tempted Jesus a third time. I will make you ruler over all the world if you will but fall at my feet and worship me. <laughs> In the same way the evil one leads us to lust after material things, instead of doing good towards others through the giving of alms, through the performing of works of selfless charity. This, beloved, is a concupiscence of the heart and its fruit, the stinginess of avarice. But was it really a contest between Christ and the devil? in the sense that the outcome was not certain before the trials even began. Jesus' severe fast and surmounting of temptation is God's demonstration to us the need for following the dictate of conscience rightly formed by right reason in all of our ways and doings. For true life and true freedom must always turn the heart and act towards God and away from the shallow attraction of sin, the temptation to which is on all sides. In the desert, Christ was the victory of life over death. Our life won by his death freely offered. He used the bright sword of Holy Scripture to turn back the, sed uh, the seductions of the Prince of Lies. And so Jesus refuted Satan by quoting Psalm 90, the basis for the scriptural references found throughout the entirety of today's liturgy. His truth, says the psalmist, referring to the truth of God, will cover you as with a shield. <laughs> Beloved, this, is, this Psalm 90 expresses the ideal of Lent. This is a special time of warfare against the devil and all of his temptations. He has given his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways. This verse recurs in Vespers throughout the whole of the Lenten season. The whole of Psalm 90 
is taken up in today's tract, just recited between the reason readings, and the verses are used for the introit, the gradual, the offertory, and the communion in today's Mass liturgy. I urge you to meditate upon this psalm, as I do year by year, during your prayers, not only this week, but throughout Lent, the length of Lent, because it will strengthen your wills for the Lenten warfare, which has only now just begun. Side by side with Psalm 90 stands today's epistle reading. St. Paul borrows a text from Isaiah, In an acceptable time I have heard you, and in the day of salvation I have helped you. Beloved, the ramification of Paul's thinking is quite obvious. Now is the acceptable time. Now is the day of salvation. In quoting Paul's use of Isaiah, the Church puts into our heart the call of the season. Time is short, the day of our judgment is unknown to us. Lent is the acceptable time for penance, and the sharpening of our spiritual weaponry. So do not put off what this season demands. Be ye converted to God. Humble your wills by the mortification of your bodies, increase in prayer, and do works of charity, and all these things in atonement for your sins. Saint Leo the Great, teaches us that, quote, although there is no season in the year which is not rich in divine gifts, nevertheless, in this season, Christians must be stirred with more zeal for spiritual progress and possessed of very great confidence in Almighty God. In this manner, with pure souls and bodies, we shall celebrate this mystery of the Lord's passion, sublime beyond all others. It is true that we ought to always stand in the Divine Presence, just as much as on the Easter Feast. But because this spiritual vigor is possessed only by a very few, while on the one hand weakness of our flesh leads any severe observance to be relaxed, and on the other, the various occupations of life share and divide our hearts. It necessarily happens that the dust of this world soils the heart of even religious persons. This divine institution, Lent, has been planned with great profit to our salvation, so that these 40 days may help us regain the purity of our souls, making up in a way for the faults of the rest of the year, by fasting and pious deeds. However, we must be careful that our behavior be not inconsistent with our fasting and penance, for it is useless to reduce the nourishment of the body except that the soul depart from sin." Unquote. Beloved, this season of Lent was held by many Church Fathers to be of apostolic institution. It was certainly everywhere enforced by the end of the 4th century, an obligatory season of ascetic self-denial and augmented prayer. Lent without fasting, Lent without prayer, Lent without almsgiving is nothing more than a self-deception. The relaxed laws which are presently in force in the Roman Catholic Church notwithstanding, the whole of tradition, Judaic and Christian, both East and West, calls for an annual season of serious penance and prayer, and in Christianity this penance and prayer takes the principal form of fasting from bodily food intake. Indeed, Lent now is the acceptable time. Now 
is the day of our salvation. So, beloved, let us, like Christ, take up the weapon of God's truth and resist the temptation of the evil one, which will be immediately to have you overthrow any good intention. So, if you have not yet done so, you must establish for yourselves a Lenten rule, which is both practical and realistic. But make sure it includes a serious reduction in the normal amount of food you consume each day, with a special mind for doing without meat. If you give up chocolates during Lent, you have given up nothing at all. If you give up eating anything but one full meal a day, that is Lenten uh, fasting. Abstain as well from worldly occupations. Turn off your televisions. I should probably say more emphatically these days, turn off your computer. Even turn off your cell phones. Eliminate socializing. And in that, that salutary vacuum in which you will be lost, increase the time you give daily to God in prayer, in meditation on Holy Scripture, in spiritual reading, in doing good to others. And primarily, lest our behavior be inconsistent with our penance, let us act with true modesty and genuine charity, conforming ourselves to Christ. In a word, by God's grace and the deepening of our humility before Him, let us persevere in our Lenten penance with long-suffering and sweet disposition, knowing that the real goal is not heroics in self-denial. In other words, do not punish your household because you are fasting and hungry and now meaner than you used to be. No, the end in view is that we may grow in Christ in the deepening of our relationship with Him to the end that, by His grace and our penance, we may prepare ourselves for the Easter mystery, and not only the one that comes at the end of this season, but that eternal Easter, which is our true life with God in the glory of the world to come. Please rise. Credo in unum Deum, Amen.